There have been at least six murders in the past 48 hours. In Detroit. Disturbing video now of a man shooting a bouncer outside a strip club in Detroit. Crime hits hard. A rash of murders has Detroit police and residents on alert today. He said the budget is not going to allow for more police. So police need the community to help to continue the overall decrease in crime. One company hits back harder. Tired of waiting for police and sick of crime, some frustrated local homeowners and businesses are turning to a new kind of security. Their movement is captured on cameras and recorded on computers back at the control center. Within minutes, this intruder has company. Missions. The father, who was a drug dealer from Yemen, currently at the home. Our objective is to reunite the two-year-old daughter with the mother, who was taken from Arizona against the mother's will. The victim is in trouble, they can press this button, and the team here can track down their exact location. Life and death hang in the balance. Until the day I die. Putting their lives on the line to save others. Until the day Fighters. Detroit. This episode of Cop Block is brought to you by Freekeen.com. In February of 2012, I posted a write-up to copblock.org titled, Frustrated, Detroit residents compete with police. Included in the story was a picture of Dale Brown, founder of the Threat Management Center. A year later, when I knew I was to roll through Detroit as part of the cop block tour, I reached out to Brown, who graciously welcomed me at his facility and shared with me some of his time and knowledge. It was definitely worth a stop. My name is Dale Brown, founder of the Threat Management Center, located in Detroit. What Threat Management Center represents in general is how to properly manage human threats to create the most nonviolent outcome possible. I started in 1995 uh, in the security capacity helping the community deal with violent criminals. We're doing home invasions and murders in our area. I would call police, I would constantly reach out, and uh, what I found was there was a general apathy and complacency where law enforcement was just not interested as a group. There were certain officers that were motivated and those community oriented officers uh, bonded with our organization and we were able to, with their assistance, uh, create a condition where all the murders, home invasions and other types of violent crimes stopped. The results of stopping the violence and the criminal activity was a good quality of life for the residents that lived there, which ultimately led to the building owners going to the black for the first time in 20 years. And it just took a couple of good officers, and my staff consisted uh, initially uh, consisted just of me, a dog, and a rifle. And then it just grew from there. I just got volunteers from the community to help out. I got the building owners to give me one free apartment in each building and a small financial stipend. It didn't take much money, but it took lots of self-sacrifice. The key was to put the protection of the families before my own and to think about one thing which was good quality of life for the people there. And the way to do that was to use not the legal system to prosecute people, but to prevent the conditions which led to, which could lead to, violent encounters. And that includes having heroic law enforcement officers out there putting themselves at risk not thinking about themselves, not thinking about getting home to their families safely at night, but thinking about the citizens getting home to their families first and foremost. We need that kind of policing. The kind of policing we have right now typically is an officer thinking about their own safety and that's what they're taught. That false thought process means they can't truly protect anyone appropriately. The cornerstone for protection is love, not violence, not guns, not laws. You cannot and you will not truly protect anything that you do not love. But if you love something, love someone, love people, you can protect them. And it starts with yourself. Having people that love themselves, 
love their uh, family members, love their community, love people in general. Those are the people that can protect the best because they will put themselves at risk for others and that is the key. That level of intention and dedication is the key to stopping violent predatory behavior. You want these predators to realize there is no way they're going to achieve violence perpetrated against families because, or the people that are there, because when the violent predator sees them, they're gonna realize this person's dedicated to the safety there and they're gonna back down. And if they don't back down, that person will be able to manage threats properly if they go through our training. And that's what really separates our organization from, from any other, is the fact that it really is designated and designed specifically to create non-violence, but if there is gonna be violence, to make sure that you're significantly capable of managing those threats properly. We constantly recruit, we're a performance-based organization. Our bodyguard program, which is called VIPER, stands for Violence Intervention Protective Emergency Response System. The foundation for its success is in the fact that the individuals that are in our organization in order to participate, have to be altruistic. Our lifeblood of this organization is having people that are really talented, really motivated, and highly skilled by constantly training them. And those people that do not want to train or are not good enough are replaced by better people. We are not looking for people and we do not accept people who are uh, human predator uh, oriented. So people that like to fight or people that like to shoot people. Uh, a lot of times guys come back from the military uh, organizations and I have to uh, be careful because we're not looking for the kind of mindset that says you know what it's okay to use violence uh, as long as you can legally explain it we're looking for people that don't want to use violence under any conditions what we emphasize is a hundred ways in a situation which would normally be fatal force oriented a hundred ways to not have a violent or fatal incident take place we perform 24 hours a day seven days a week we protect communities here in Detroit uh, upscale communities like Palmer Woods, Sherwood Forest, and the golf course. We have approximately a thousand homes that depend on us for safety, responding to them and their uh, families and their emergencies. And we have approximately 500 home, uh, businesses that are our clients as well. And then the people that cannot afford our services, we help them for free. The reason that we can do that is because there is a healthy profit margin left over from excellence uh, from providing for our major corporations. We offer free training to families. We call it Free Family Friday. Typically, the prosecutor's offices, the shelters in the area for domestic violence victims, stalking victims are sent to us for assistance. We protect them for free. We ask them to court. If they have a violent uh, ex-husband or boyfriend or neighbor or some stranger that's that's coming after them, we will literally stay with them, transport their kids to school. We stay with them at their homes with our rifles and keep them alive. And in 20 years, none of us have uh, had a court date. And more importantly, none of us have been killed. And the most important, no one who's ever come to us for help in 20 years has ever been injured or killed after coming to this organization. On Mondays, we have a free class for any sworn law enforcement officer. We have a state trooper that I've trained for 10 years who's in charge of the law enforcement section here. And we don't believe in being weapon dependent here. Here, guns are uh, like a first aid kit, something you should have, but not something you should depend on. When they have an option to not injure someone, often they would choose that had their training system given that to them. And so that's one of the things we do is try to fill a person's toolbox, thinking of their mental toolbox as uh, the toolbox that you go around answering all your questions with. We make sure that in that toolbox are so many options to create a nonviolent outcome that it's almost impossible to have violence. So we show you how to get close, how to use psychology to uh, to take that person's perspective and change it so there is no adversarial perspective. And if there is going to be one, you're so close, you can still take control of that person without injuring them. So it's all it's all positive. Creating positive outcomes, nonviolence equals a prosperous outcome. And that's one of the things we want to encourage all communities, all corporations, law enforcement institutions to realize it is focusing on the prevention of the conditions which leads to violence, which is the key to creating a safe, successful society. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on the seasofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. 
Uh, peaceful anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT no government license. Uh, this allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can t- find out more information about that at BIPCOT.org in the description. So today I'm delighted to have Dale Brown, who's coming in from Detroit, Michigan. He is with the uh, Vipers Threat Management Center. Uh, website is ThreatManagementCenter.com. And he's and on Twitter it's at Threat Managers. Uh, so Facebook is v- Vipers Threat Management Center, and then you can also find him on his personal page, Dale Brown, uh, on Facebook. And we'll talk about you know how he got into the whole um, you know private security uh, defense field. Uh, what 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 got him into that, as well as you know what what Viper stands for and, and what his uh, organization is all about, because I think. Uh, a lot of people will be interested to find out just how um, just how profitable peace and prosperity can be. <laughs> I think you, you guys do a great job of that. So, uh, so Dale, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, no, no problem. I, yeah, I heard you on uh, on Tom Woods, and you were on Jeff Berwick, and um, like you're getting around, and, and you told me before you were on a lot of other um, uh, outlets, which is really great. You know, g- getting your word out there because so many people. Uh, have a hard time understanding, like, well, how can you be better than the police? Like, like the, they're the police, you know? They're supposed to protect us and they keep us safe. And, you know, <laughs> you know this is what the well, movies tell me. The movies tell me the police keep us safe. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, by now, people should see that there's something wrong with that definition. In fact, most police officers uh, will tell you there's something wrong with that definition. Uh, law enforcement is law enforcement. They enforce laws. Now, sometimes enforcing laws can be beneficial to public safety. Not very often though, in general, it's a negative metrics. In other words, you must have arrests for something. Uh, Those things that are most disconcerting are things like rape, robbery, and killing, because in order to arrest for those things, people must have perpetrated those things, which is the opposite of public safety. Right. So public safety would be the prevention of the things that the police are measured by. (laughs) So that doesn't, that would not be by definition. Therefore, law enforcement is not actually protection. It is actually law enforcement. So we don't do policing. We don't police people. We don't privately police people. That's disrespectful to what I do uh, as an organization, as an individual. I don't believe in that. I don't force people to do things. I don't uh, uh, use intimidation in order to create uh, a way for us to have a non violent outcome. What I do is use inspiration and I teach through my school. And this is one of the things that's that's very important for people to understand. We are a school first. So the number one most important thing that we bring to the table is education. The understanding of what I created called tactical psychology combined with what I created called tactical law combined with the actual skill set, the tactics. uh, This is what gives you the complete package in order to manage violent human behavior and create nonviolent outcomes. So we're the only organization that is involved in public safety, the only organization that has a school that's dedicated to creating nonviolent outcomes by having superior tactical skills, the understanding of law, and most importantly, understanding human behavior, how humans think. This is how we're able to create the nonviolent adversarial interactions by understanding psychology uh, and understanding how to use that information to create a bridge uh, in which we can take someone psychologically from where we are in a dispute or uh, situation of discourse and create a nonviolent outcome, a psychological bridge towards a peaceful outcome by design, not by hope. Yeah, what's so beautiful is uh, I remember you talking about how, you know, you guys are like, you guys, you know, you look tough, you look big and, you, you know, people, you, I guess intimidating, but you use that like um, um, stature, I guess, authority that people give you just by the way you look. And then and then um, you also use psychology in order to diffuse 10 situations that probably, you know, a police officer would not necessarily have those tools. And you guys do it in such an awesome way. <laughs> and, and how you said you recently even stopped carrying weapons, like uh, lethal weapons, right? Um, right. Can you, can you go into that a little more? Uh, first of all, there are many officers that, that use this kind of approach, uh, uh, police officers. It's just 
they're few and far between amongst all the others. Mm -hmm. And they're also normally uh, chastised for being positive officers. Wow. So those police officers do exist that know mm -hmm. how to use psychology uh, in, in a very similar way to us. Uh, ours just is an actual system. Mm -hmm. So it's not an individual coming up with like a, their own form of Columbo, uh, an old an old school the police detective that used to use cunning to communicate with people. It's not just that. It is really how to bond with another human being right. in a positive way and create a non-adversarial interaction. If, if The only time that we need to have uh, uh, take someone into custody is if they hurt someone. Mm -hmm. If they didn't hurt another person, then we can simply talk them out, talk them out of a place that's just been terminated, talk them away from their ex-girlfriend or ex-wife's house or ex-husband's house, uh, talk them off the property of someone who asked them not to be there. Uh, we can create nonviolent situations. How about when it's not necessarily a legal situation, it's a situation based in fear. When we when we walk up to people in total uh, darkness, in the middle of the night, uh, in the street, we don't have fear. The only reason we don't have fear is not because we're fools. It's because we have training. We train every week in close quarters tactics. How to dominate other humans in physical violence means that we, since we have the knowledge, we don't need to show it off and we are calm. Where other people would panic and draw a gun and, and begin to think about their, their their safety, we would be calm. And even though they said, I'll kill you, we could actually still talk to them without saying it back to them. Right. We can actually say something non-threatening back because we don't feel threatened. We don't feel threatened because we replace threat, the feeling of threat, with actual skill set. So this is how people understand. If you embrace fear, if you let it into your mind subconsciously, consciously you'll act on it. Uh, and so what we do is remove that through advanced tactical skills that we train on every week, we test on every week, and this is what determines your position, performance. Not because you're older, not because you've been here longer. In fact, a younger guy can come along and take your position if they outperform you. That's why we have more in common with a sports team, like a professional football team, than we do with a police department. <laughs> because the best person with the best outcome has the position. It doesn't matter what their ethnicity is, their religion, how tall they are. None of that matters. Hmm. What special forces unit they were with, if they were a sniper, do, do, they, have, do they have a PhD? Hmm. Can they not spell PhD? Only <laughs> thing that matters, only thing that matters is are you a good communicator? Are you the kind of person that can create a non-adversarial interaction with another person, even when they're angry, even when they're threatening your life? Are you still able to be, remain calm and show them humanity even though they're being disrespectful and threatening and threatening you with inhumanity in response mm -hmm. do you have the strong enough willpower to control your fear <laughs> and still remain confident because you're competent at managing violent criminal threat and violent human predation uh human human uh predation uh in, in such a way that you don't let it affect your uh your actual actions that's very unusual but that can only happen if you have a training system to support that initiative. That's why no matter what anybody tells you, they can't do the right thing when it comes to violence. Because once you are in a position that you believe your life is in danger, you are now going to revert to a primal instinctive response. That primal instinctive response is there to preserve your life. Mm -hmm. It is only through advanced psychological training that you can overcome your natural ur urge to self-preserve. We all have a natural urge to self-preserve. That is, that's how we're wired as humans. And so we don't do dumb things, get ourselves killed. Uh, that fear causes a response. And that response is usually fight or flight. Mm. We respond, we, we remove that through actual skill set development, through having training, understanding of how to read body language properly. And this is how you gain your confidence. Mm. It's through actual competence. Mm. And now so you, you, even though a normal person would feel fear because a guy's standing in front of you and he's on drugs or he's high, he's drunk and he's got a weapon, he's talking about killing you or killing someone else, you're going to close the gap. You're going to talk to him positively. You're going to stand next to him, not in front of him, hmm. not in front of him. Hmm. You're going to get elbow control. Stand next to him and talk to him and let him know how many ways you support his argument. Hmm. No matter yeah. how stupid the argument is. His argument could be that uh, uh, all blacks are animal monkeys. 
Right. I will run right next to him. I will get right next to him, and I will agree with him, and I'll talk about monkeys. We're going to walk together out of this building. Uh, and when we're done, we're going to shake hands or hug and, you know, leave each other uh, without any issue. Uh, and then he'll probably be walking away going, hey, was that guy black? <laughs> I think he was African American. I was an African American guy I was talking to. I couldn't even, you couldn't even tell. <laughs> right. I, he was so nice. We agreed on so many things. I, I barely – he's just a tan – he must just be tan Mexican Italian. That's what it was. Tan Italian. He couldn't, so, have, been, he couldn't have been black. <laughs> Yeah, it can't be because I said monkey. He was agreeing with me. (laughs) At the end of the day, you have to separate yourself psychologically from the task. The task is to create nonviolence. Everything else is failure. So if you have to yell at someone, if you have to put your hands on them for any reason, if you have to use a weapon of any kind, if you have to hurt them in any way, you are a failure. The level of failure is commensurate with the level of force you needed. Hmm. So if you end up having to shoot someone, you seriously screwed up. Mm-hmm. Then you know there's no reward, so you don't say, "Oh, look, there's a gunman. You killed the gunman. You're now a winner." No, you should have been able to create in that gunman the fear and the ability to believe the best thing to do was not shoot, put the gun down, and give up. Right. How you do that is up to you. You have to use your superior intelligence, your superior understanding of ingenuity and initiative. Hmm. So it's intellect, ingenuity, and initiative that are three eyes, the most important things to what we're looking for in terms of a person on our staff. Uh, and as an organization, what we do is through our constant training uh, and developing of confidence based on your competence, uh, we focus uh, on the, the, the evolution. So you actually enjoy learning. Uh, if you don't want, and we have a saying, you're either learning or you're leaving. Hmm. <laughs> you cannot hang out with us. We're not a gang. Right. Uh, you cannot worship me. You have no esprit de corps. In other words, you do not worship the group. Mm. You can only, only think about one thing, and that's the outcomes. That's because that's the true value. Mm. That's the value to humanity. That's the value to clients. Mm. If I tell the clients, oh, you, you spent a million dollars with us, and uh, we really tried, but we failed, but we'll do better in the future, we're done. Mm. We're done here. So what we have to focus on is creating the outcome. So when cigarette companies hired me, it didn't matter I don't like cigarettes. What matters is people should be able to go to work without being uh, hijacked, Mm -hmm. without being stabbed, without being taken hostage. So local law enforcement, the state police, the uh, ATF got involved, and uh, they couldn't stop this $250 million company from experiencing these robberies. Mm -hmm. So I was contacted. I was referred by someone we helped that owned a grocery store. And there we stopped seniors from being attacked that was our primary task hmm. uh stopping the seniors from having their their food stamps stolen on the east side of detroit hmm. and uh we were very successful at that um families were able to go get their food without being harmed uh and uh, we didn't have to kill people to stop them either right. uh and, and have court dates and lawsuits right. uh so we um started in 1998 uh with the cigarette company before that we were exclusively in neighborhoods uh where what i did was uh I uh, used to teach my self-defense system that I created. I used to teach in a park, um, in, in several parks, and at the YMCA in Detroit. And so I didn't have any money when I first started. So I was just teach. I would just teach outside. I'd have students that would train, and then I eventually got money so I could rent a school, a martial arts school. And then as I started renting, and then eventually I got enough students uh, to where I could actually, um, you know, sustain myself. And then um, I found out living on the inside of Detroit that. I, I thought that what people needed was help as a like a liaison. So I was calling the police. I was helping them know, uh, helping the police know where the violent criminals were, you know, what direction they went in and, hmm. you know, any information and trying to get citizens to work with police. Um, I was constantly at the police station. The police were completely uninterested, uninterested in any way, shape, fashion, or form in helping to stop the violence in general. Now, certain officers were very supportive. Mm-hmm. The good, the, what they call the good guy cops. Those cops are community oriented. They supported me. They supported the organization, and they stopped any bad cops from interfering with us. And there were some bad cops that were trying to interfere. Mm-hmm. The good cops, they blocked and they they stopped them. Uh, and uh, the administrative law enforcement wing, uh, above all of them, they took over when they saw our results. Our results were no negative media stories, 
because we don't kill unarmed people. We don't beat up people that aren't being violent at the time. And we did not have to kill people uh, and and uh, kill unarmed people uh, because we found ways to solve issues normally nonviolently. And we used a lot of psychology. Hmm. Uh, the results of which meant that there was no negative occurrences uh, in the jurisdiction. And in that same jurisdiction, 911 calls went down in one square block by 300 a month. Wow. <laughs> That's great. The commander <laughs> in, that, in that area got known for that, and that shot him up the chain of command here. Hmm. That he was able to do something in the area and create a, an area where there was known for extreme crime. There was a murder once a month in this one square block, <clears throat> and there were daily home invasions. Hmm. When I say home invasions, I mean like uh, third world, you know, groups of men rushing in your home. And by the way, there was a, a lesbian gang as well, which I didn't even heard of that. Wow. So when I saw them, I just thought it was women who were assertive with short <laughs> hair. And it turns out they, they were offended that I didn't recognize them as a gang. So I, I, did, I did recognize them as a gang. Wow. And I treated them accordingly. Uh, wow. wow. <laughs> and uh, they were very violent towards, especially they were raping single moms attacking their children, oh, uh, breaking in their homes. Wow. So I work, I tried to work with police as much as possible. Hmm. Even to this day, we always call police first before we take any action. Mm -hmm. And we interact with police probably, you know, one out of 10, no, more like one out of, uh, yeah, maybe like one out of 10 calls we might see the police. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually the police are approximately five to 25 minutes after we arrive <laughs> at a situation. Uh, and by the time the police get there, it's usually pretty much stable or so, over, so, so or, you guys always arrive first you're saying yeah yeah, yeah with except it's very rare um maybe maybe uh, uh maybe one out of 100 calls the police will be there before us no oh, wow it's, it's very rare that's, that's very rare. we have a very fast response time though. nice so um and uh but when i started on the east side uh, i didn't have any money i went to the building owners and i said listen we need to help the families uh, because they're being robbed and killed in your in the apartment buildings you own here. The building owners were from the suburbs, very wealthy men. They explained women, uh, one was a little lady. They explained to me that they don't want my help. They don't need my help. And they're not going to help me hmm. because there's not, they're not interested in anything I have to sell. And I wasn't selling anything except safety for the families. They hmm. were not interested in safety for the families. Hmm. So then I went back to them. I didn't get, I got, I was a little, I was a little discouraged, but I didn't let it affect my overall objective. My objective was family safety. So if that's true, then I can't let someone say something or do something that interferes in that mission. Hmm. So what I did was I uh, went back to the same wealthy people. And I said, uh, give me six months. Give me a free apartment because I'm about to get evicted anyway. I don't have any money. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so the guy was like, okay, I'll give you six months. Uh, but I'm putting you out if, you don't, if, if it doesn't work. And I don't believe it's going to work. Because quite honestly, what could you do that the Detroit Police Department couldn't do? Yeah. I mean, how's that possible? Right. You're one guy and a dog with, and a rifle. What's that? Oh, so that was, was just like, that, well, that, that was just you at that time. Yeah, it was just me wow. and a dog and a rifle. Wow. And poverty. Wow. <laughs> I, my friends were poverty and poverty. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I told him, I said, uh, well, you know, I, I will do my, I don't know. You know, I was really thinking like, I don't know what one person could do, honestly. <laughs> but I saw it in the movies. I saw movies. Charles uh, Bronson. Right. Uh, some old school movies. Uh -huh. I saw them. Uh, Clint Eastwood. Uh -huh. um, Walking Tall. Uh -huh. uh, Billy Jack. These are movies you need to go see. Uh -huh. um, so you can understand <laughs> why I thought. Some, some home, 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 homework for the audience. Okay. Right. Homework for the audience. So I thought this could work because I watched those movies. Now, once I once I encountered real bloodshed, because I grew up in Ann Arbor, a college town, Ann Arbor, Michigan, the home of University of Michigan, um, I, I really had no idea that the police were not interested in, in prevention of crimes. They were interested in prosecution of right. crimes. Right, right. So when I was talking about was prevention, they were like, what do you, what do you mean go there now? What do you, they didn't do anything. There's right. not, there's not, no one's dead yet. <laughs> no one's like, dead well, yet. We well, can't, we come we, over here now, there won't be anyone dead. They're like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the point. We, How dumb are you, sir? <laughs> if you keep calling us, we'll keep coming around. We can't catch anyone. 
Crowd's like, that's kind of the point. That's the point. <laughs> like, 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 doesn't it say protect and serve on on your cars? Like, <laughs> they are, man. Their idea is protect and serve by prosecuting people. Right. Period. Okay. After so, the after the person dies, yeah. Can you imagine them showing up like, hey, uh, when's the last time you heard of an award for police called? You have the least number of awards, arrests award. Right. Uh, we noticed your department has the lowest number of arrests. Good job. Right. When did you, when did you ever hear about that? <laughs> exactly. Your department wrote the least number of tickets. You guys are awesome. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, no one ever said that, and they right. don't get rewards for that. They get rewards for negative metrics. Right. So when we talk about police, <clears throat> we got to remember policing is not public safety. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so I get offended when people go, you guys are like, you guys are like really good because you guys are like private police. Absolutely not. Hmm. You can't call me and say, my neighbor's making loud music. Go make him stop. Right. Police can. What I do is I'll go over there and talk to him and say, listen, hey, guys, you know, uh, or, you know, man, whatever. Um, you know, your neighbor's got, you know, children trying to sleep. Would you mind turning it down for your neighbors? Mm-hmm. And if they mind and they're like, no, we're going to have a party anyway. <laughs> There's nothing I'm going to do. <laughs> Right. I'm not going to write him a ticket. Right. I'm not going to go beat him up. Right. I did my part. When You know, hey, you live next to a, no- a noisy neighbor. Yeah. You have a choice to move. Right. I hope you don't. And, then, <laughs> you know, we'll try to talk to them. But we're not going to force them to turn their music down. I'm not going to beat them up at their party. I'm not going to attack them. And I'm not calling the police um, more than once because we have to call because we're hired. So yeah. in that case where it's volunteer, I don't have to call the police. Mm-hmm. For situations that are misdemeanors, mm-hmm. uh, we do call police for every felony violent situation first. So before we approach any situation, we call nine one one so that legally no one can ever say we were usurping authority. Mm. Uh, we only take action when there's exigent circumstances. So there's never a time when someone said you guys were being vigilantes ever. You are forbidden to move unless there is exigent circumstances where we can't call. We always call. Mm. And even and when we interact with people, we video record everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if it's an embarrassing recording, oh well. <laughs> we don't lie about it and say, oh, no, no, that video is lying. All right. No, that's not uh, that's not what I said. So, so you're saying you're saying you don't you don't confiscate people's phones and destroy them on the spot? <laughs> Absolutely not. Not even if I work for Justin Bieber. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was overseas. I was overseas with Fifty Cent. Okay, you know that was a while ago. Really? So, <laughs> and uh, I was a bodyguard for a guy named Fabulous. Uh-huh. That was a while ago. Wow. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the the uh, the bodyguards got arrested and jailed. Uh, they worked for um, Fifty Cent because they attacked people for their phones. But first, they got beat up mm-hmm. in Paris because mm-hmm. African people do not want you touching their phones. Right. <laughs> And they move in a group of 30 or something. So yeah. they're grabbing phones. They got beat up. And they got arrested for stealing phones. Yeah. You can't touch people's phones. <laughs> Native awesome. Americans are against their images being taken. I understand. However, unless you're on the reservation, your image can be taken. Right. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. So stop it. When people come to us, they're going, can I take your video? Can I videotape you? Yes, you can. Can I, take a, can I take a picture? Absolutely. Right. And so my guys, so, you know, the uh, way I train my staff is, you know, I'll, I'll say to them, I go, what do you say when someone says that? Uh, some guys will go, oh, oh, yeah, I would say no, because, you know, we're on duty. You can't record us. I said, really? <laughs> mm. I said, so what do you do if they start recording? You're going to say, stop, stop, turn it off. So what about when paparazzi record stars? Do you think that Kanye West gave permission? Yeah. Okay, maybe he did. <laughs> The point is, <laughs> not really. <laughs> you, you can't do that. So right. people are surprised. With the, uh, like I even have guys, when we're recording them, they'll go, oh, you're recording me? Yes, sir. Well, I don't want to. I don't consent to recording. That's okay. I wish I didn't have to record you. But yeah. unfortunately, we're talking to each other. Right. So I'm going to record everything right. so I can show what I said to you and what you said to me. Let's just both be very professional in how we talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Okay? And they're like, well, I'm going to record you back. And I go, absolutely record me too. Yes. <laughs> right. Let's record each other. Let's have a recording war. <laughs> so all we're going to do is record each other, doing everything we're supposed to, and we're going to record each other being very, very polite and positive. Right. And they yeah. say, you know, nothing violent happens. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the one of the best ways, uh, you know, to ensure the truth comes out and and to ensure peaceful interactions is is the yes. um, be, this technology that it, that enables people to record situations yes. that yes. before it's like up to you know you know which which witness saw this, how far away were you, what obstructions. <laughs> well, I mean now now what you're seeing is people are say, they're just discounting the video altogether. I mean, the video is obvious and it's showing the killing of someone unnecessarily. Right. And they're still like, well, well, you know, I'm scared of black people. So I still kind of think it's okay. Right. I mean, it's crazy. Like, mm. it, 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 this, uh, the latest one where they shot the uh, the guy in the stairwell, Gurley, in New York. Like, really? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't hear about that this, one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, the officer got convicted in this case, first time in uh, many, many years in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was he was then uh, um, not required to go to jail. Really, <laughs> that's an example of good old Americana uh, jury nullification. What yeah. they do is they just decide you will not be punished. Yeah, uh, and that's happened many times throughout our history. Right. So it's just, it's that's normal when it comes to African American life. There's just zero point negative. There's a negative one hundred percent value. Mm. So so think of it this way. There's African Americans that shoot other African Americans every day. Right. The NRA does not offer them any money for their guns. The NRA does not offer them any assistance. No, no finders fees. No extra funds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they don't care. Right. Right? Right, right. There's a bunch of African Americans that use guns to shoot other African Americans. Right. Right. But and there's a bunch of a uh, bunch more European Americans who shot more European Americans. Yeah. And the NRA was giving them money for that. Mm -hmm. But if you're European American and you shoot. An African American, the NRA will support you, give you money. Hmm. I mean, that's crazy, man. I'm an NRA fire instructor. I'm so disgusted. Hmm. I, I, I just stopped sending the money. Right. <laughs> I mean, think about the concept of that. You're gonna give, you're gonna give a guy money for shooting an unarmed kid. Really? Wow. Really? That's that's the plan. That's the whole plan. You're gonna tell. So I'm teaching all these gun, these gun laws. Uh, you know, keep your finger off the trigger. Right. You know, never point at anything you don't intend to shoot. Right. And you know, can't shoot unarmed people. Right. And blah blah blah. And then all of a sudden, it turns out you can shoot a certain unarmed people. That's pretty cool. Even okay. if they're a child, it's still sweet as long as you know they have a hoodie on. <laughs> or what? I'm from Ann Arbor. Ninety nine percent European American kids and adults they smoke weed and they have hoodies. Yeah. And they all go to college. Right. And no one ever gets killed ever. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's no crotch searching by police for weed, <laughs> and every year they have a hash bash in Ann Arbor, where you, uh, where thousands, thousands, and thousands of kids, adults, excuse me, uh, smoke weed and walk around without getting arrested by the police. Mm -hmm. Every year since 19, I don't know, 60. Right. So I grew up in Ann Arbor, and and I came to Detroit, and they act like a joint is like uh, the end of the world. I just left a meeting <laughs> here in Detroit. They are up in arms. Not about the liquor stores, which there's like 10,000 liquor stores next to 20,000 churches. They're not worried about that. They're worried about medicinal marijuana. Right. Right? They're very worried about this. It's, oh, yeah. It's very serious. Like, why don't you, you know, I mean, if you could just, I just left the meeting right now. They are so excited about blocking marijuana. So, so They're going to go to the bar tonight and have some liquor. Is this That's is, how excited they are? Is this a, like the local city government that, that you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, city city government. Yep, here in Detroit. Yeah, I just left a meeting uh, with um, one of our upscale communities that we protect. Okay, and um, it was a big board meeting, and it, it held me up. That's why that's why I ended up late no with you. Um, I was supposed to be it's supposed to be over at like seven. Oh, okay, and uh, they ended up going to like eight something. I I I was terrible. I I was in hell. Oh. <laughs> as I had to listen to. Why marijuana is horrible. Oh, shoot. Are you talking, <laughs> you're talking to somebody. It's of the evil. It's evil. <laughs> it's, uh, it's evil. Dr. Evil. Yeah. It's invented the uh, marijuana. Right. So I'm, in this, I'm in this meeting, and I'm like, do you, do you have any idea how many people I've choked on weed? How many people I've had to take down and smoke weed uh, in ecstasy? Let's see. That would be uh, zero. <laughs> right. In 20 years. <laughs> We used to do raves. There'd be four thousand kids. Yeah. Right. Five thousand kids and not one fight. Right. <laughs> you know why? Because MDMA was used to treat uh, PTSD during Vietnam. 
mm-hmm. what they call ecstasy. Right. Uh, and marijuana, uh, really, if you want to drop the crime rate, all you do is make prisoners smoke weed, and the crime rate will drop like 90%. <laughs> Even yeah. violent criminals will just get the munchies, sleep, <laughs> and forget and make a lot of plans they do not care they do not carry out <laughs> all yeah. the guys i know that smoke weed have great plans and those plans are standing right now right. they're standing by they have great plans that they're, they're the hypothesis the theories the speculation is all there they're very intelligent yeah. but they're all the guys i know smoke too much weed these guys <laughs> cannot follow through with anything so, <laughs> But the one thing they never do is crime. You know why? Because they don't get around to it. They're just, <laughs> they're just, you just relax. It. Come on. And there's, 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 everything is good with the world. <laughs> right. Their only problem is uh, overbreeding. But, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, they're afflicted by the overbreeding uh, issue. Right. Apparently pretty, girl, pretty girls like weed. So that's, a, <laughs> so that's an issue. Some ugly guys have weed, so it helps them. Right. Uh, nice. Then, <laughs> Calms down the yeah, nerves. this is. This is a very important security-related matter for public safety. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the weed is allowing ugly men access to pretty women. We need to address that issue. <laughs> oh, man. yeah. Then, then you compare the, the people who die from uh, you know alcohol-related illness or you know properly prescribed oh, prescription medication, you know F- FDA-approved prescription, <laughs> which is all legal, all legal. <laughs> The, the, the person that the, I mean, the nicest lawyer surgeon in the world drinking alcohol becomes a violent menace, and, and that's legal. Right. It's ridiculous, man. Totally ridiculous. So I don't drink or smoke anything. So for me, think about how stupid this sounds. Uh, alcohol is legal. That's okay. But this weed stuff's got to go. It's evil. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm just I'm just an observer. Okay. I'm saying I never had a problem with someone smoked weed. Ever. Yeah, right. Crack included. By the way, I deal with crackheads quite often uh-huh. over this my time period here in Detroit. And um not not just Detroit, because guess what? The majority of crackheads go to work every day. Mm. Okay? You can't buy a Bentley as a crack dealer with people on a bicycle stealing car radios. <laughs> okay. So let's be clear about who's on crack. People on crack have good jobs to afford the crack. Yeah. And crack does not kill. And how do you know? Because um, not only do crackheads uh, that you know uh, ever see, you see them forever unless they get killed by the police. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or hit by a car or something, right? right. The, uh, otherwise, crack, for some reason, I think it preserves your life. Because I know guys are crackheads. They will wash a car with spit and a, a napkin and in, in sub-zero weather <laughs> and not complain. <laughs> okay? <laughs> These guys should ride bicycles backwards in the snow. Right. And uh, crack is like, Soldiers should have cracks so they can just go to war because yeah. it just apparently makes you tough as I don't know what. Right. Um, so, but at the end of the day, man, uh, I've never been attacked by a crackhead. I could talk to them, I, you know, hey, hmm. you know, stop doing that. You know, please don't do that. They're, no problem, right? Yeah. I could be, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we had a doctor that got cut off, true story, surgeon, uh-huh. that got cut off out in the suburbs, one of our upscale suburbs, we're working an event. This guy is a surgeon near a yacht club and he just decides that when he got cut off that he is going to threaten to kill the bartender with bombs i will blow mm. this place up i will bomb you uh-huh. so you know we didn't call atf right we didn't we didn't have the place surrounded by swat team or anything right <laughs> my guy just went up and said sir you know you have to go and this doctor grabbed his arm and bit a hole in it hmm. wow this is a surgeon okay mad because he was cut off from alcohol <laughs> Oh, now I have never had that from a crackhead, a cokehead, wow. a weedhead, nothing, wow. and nothing like that. None of my. None, so I've had thousands of people that come from my, from my organization now. Right. Thousands, right. approximately five thousand people have come through my program. Hmm. We have never been attacked by crackheads or cokeheads or any of that. So, so what are you trying to say that the what the media portrays is false? <laughs> no, the media is very accurate, sir. I want to go on record. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, Osama, I mean, Osama, I mean. Osama did it. He was just lying because he was a, he was a liar. <laughs> Osama's a liar. He just he felt bad at the end, and he's we didn't say that he did it because Osama is a liar. Uh. We know, okay, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. Like the way the way the film industry, like Hollywood movies, yeah, the way, the way they portray drugs, drug dealers, um, you know, weed and the police. You know, the police are you know the um, the selfless, brave, courageous people who throw themselves into harm's way. You know, put themselves second and uh, protect the innocent and all things like that. And okay, 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 stop there. So <laughs> police always say this to to. to and so imagine this: there are good cops that joined, like they were, they, they saw TV shows, they wanted to do that, right? Then they get in there, and they're like, "Okay, listen, rule number one: stay safe out there. <laughs> Wherever you go, you make sure you stay safe first. You get home to your family at night. That's what you do. Your number one goal: fuck these people. You get home to your family. Uh, okay, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Um, how does that make sense? If my goal is to get home to my family, how can I do that going into people's dark backyards? Mm-hmm. For sure, right? Yeah. So when a, uh, a six foot eight super athletic officer gets gunned down chasing a fifteen year old kid, true story. <clears throat> he got shot in his crotch. You know they don't, they don't have the tactics, man. We teach cops for free. I want cops to stop dying on our watch. So I actually train them for free, man. Wow. So they understand the biomechanics on how to take people down without killing them, wow. without getting killed. Wow. One cop, six foot eight, he could be like a pro a pro football player, becomes a cop. He's all, he can leap a car, man, in full sprint. Wow. He's awesome, right? Hmm. He takes off their 15-year-old kid, takes the kid down. The kid rolls over and shoots him in his crotch, in oh. his knees. Yeah, in his crotch. Wow. In his knees. Whew. He's retired at age 26. <sighs> the officer was like a superhero. Hmm. And um, so then he grows his hair out, becomes a rebel, and limps around now with full retirement from the police department, right? Hmm. Driving an SUV gets pulled over by the cops all the time and harassed for being a thug. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? What, what's how how un- I mean, like they don't even listen to him. He's like, dude, I'm an, I'm a cop, man. I I I'm a retired cop. I was shot in the job. They're like, they don't believe him. <laughs> really? Giant dark skinned African American guy. Wow. He looks like every thug from the movies. Wow. <laughs> so they just don't give him a break. And he's like a, he was like a hero on the job. Right, right, right. And uh yeah, but so you know, the the reality is we live fantasies, man, from watching TV and, right. and uh, it, you know, the, 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 we guys, we just got to be honest and get real. A lot of police officers are inculcated in this this system of uh, that, that they didn't agree with. They started, and then you know, it's just you're, it's part of your group. So you're going to do what the group says, and and if you don't, there's a price to pay, man. Serpico had to pay the price. A lot of cops are are terrorized by their police officers when they come forward. A lot of cops uh, who do want to do the right thing are fired. Uh, relegated to the schools, mm. they're put at the uh, police officers that 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 they call officer nicely. Mm-hmm. They put them either off the department or they put them in some community policing position or community relations, or they put them in the office. Mm. Um, you know, they just like hide them so that he can't be a part of other things that they don't want to be part of. Mm. And uh, uh, so the officer with integrity, one of the ways you'll know is they don't hang out with other cops. Generally, they 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 stay with their families. They're they're kind of uh, to themselves, and they they don't want to get in that group culture, which is great. Mm-hmm. In my organization, I I discourage any off duty hanging out whatsoever. There is no family. There is a mission. We have our own individual families. We're not allowed to form artificial bonds. Our bonds are as professionals who train together, uh, but we are not a family. There's mm-hmm. no, but we have our own family, and you're encouraged right. to have your own. Right. We're not. I'm not the. I'm not your father. I'm your coach. Right. I'm not. You're not my child. I have children. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and my men have Thursday. We are not the military. We're not the police force. We're not a gang. Uh, if you are wearing my uniform, you have a higher level of responsibility and accountability than anyone. Mm. One time, a lady said, uh, back in the '90s, she said, "One of your men just called me a bitch." I said, "Really, ma'am? Which one?" So. Go up, I said, ma'am, right? Well, just show me who he was. So I go up to the guy, I said, <coughs> I said, um, this lady, she said you called her a bitch. This guy's from Puerto Rico. He says, uh, hey, is she lying? This bitch lying. <laughs> I never call a bitch a bitch. I never call a bitch a bitch. This bitch lying. I was like, you know what? You're fired right now, ma'am. I apologize. Uh, next time you come back to this event, you get in for free. And that individual, as you can see, he's fired right now. Wow. Get out. Wow. There's no like, let's have a tribunal. Let's do some. Uh, let's do some uh, uh, nurturing. Uh, <laughs> let's get. Let's get some counseling. Here's what you're gonna get. 
you know, the fuck out of my face. Wow. You, you take my take my shirt off, my uniform off. Right. You get off my property. Right. You disrespect someone. This is someone's sister, someone's daughter, someone's mother. Mm-hmm. You disrespect them is like disrespecting my sister, my mother, my daughter. Mm-hmm. You wow. understand? Wow. We don't do that. So you should run from me now. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> you should run from me right now. <laughs> it is in your best interest. So wow. uh, bottom line, man, is accountability and responsibility are one. Right. We have to understand that family, everyone is somebody's family. Mm-hmm. And you should look at every person as though they're a member of your family. <clears throat> if, you had a, if you had a crazy uncle that had a knife or a gun, and he's talking crazy about killing himself or killing other people, you would, what, shoot your uncle in the head? Mm, no. Right. You're going to say, hey, Uncle, come on, calm down, man. Right. Put the gun down. Right. You're going you're gonna to go through every year. You're going to let him even get off a couple rounds before you would ever shoot your own uncle. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. You're going to be like, all right, Uncle is not stopping. I'm going to have to shoot him. Hmm. Um, you might even take a good one for, all right, Uncle, you shot me in the leg, man. <laughs> you're going to make me kill you. Stop it. <laughs> but you're not going to be like, hey, Mom, I killed your brother because he was, you know, he's that crazy. <laughs> hey, Mom, you know how he was. I put two in his head, one is four in his chest. Oh. He's done. He's good. I, the good I, news, mom, is you get his inheritance. <laughs> grandma dies. <laughs> I mean, really, no one's gonna do that, man. If it's your family and they're having some mental illness issue, they're having a drug interaction issue. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> you're gonna you're gonna be extra extra um, loving in your response and stern. You might do a takedown on your uncle. But you're not going to bash his brains in. Mm-hmm. You're not going to try to wound him. You're going to try your best not to. Right. And it doesn't mean you're absolutely not going to kill him. You're just going to really try not to. Right. You know, that's that's the point. You're going to try not to. Now, in the event that there was no other way to stop from killing you or your mom or your aunt, you're going to you're gonna have to do what you have to do to stop your uncle. But you're really going to go to the far ends of the earth to really not hurt your family. Right. And that's why you need to look at all people you come across. People have bad days. People have drug interactions. People have mental illness. People have depression. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why someone might be violent one day and aggressive and out of control. Uh, so what we do is study techniques that allow us to dominate them psychologically first, by understanding biomechanics, uh, physically last. And what I mean by last is because the law is very, very important. Understanding civil and criminal law is vital to your survival. And so we're a survival school first, not a fight school. So, for example, your best survival strategy when <clears throat> uh, you're in a domestic situation, say your ex-wife came over, ex-girlfriend, you're now, it's time for you to run. Do you legally have to run? No. You can fight, beat her up if you want to. And you might even be able to legally prove that you had to beat her up and blah, blah, blah. Mm. That's not in your best interest. What's in your best interest is not be fighting women. All right. So get out of there. Run. Mm-hmm. Escape. <laughs> You'll be fine. She breaks up some stuff. You'll buy some new stuff. But right. beating up girls and fighting women uh, just because you can legally is not really in your best interest mm-hmm. uh, in any way, you know, uh, liability wise, as well as, as criminally. So we just teach a realistic system that's based on what's best for a good quality of life. There's nothing wrong with taking a little sprint to stop a, vi- a violent altercation mm-hmm. with a female coworker or, you know, some coworker is out of control one day. Just get out of there. Not a big deal. Right. Swallow your pride and move on. Right. And, uh, you know, replace pride with purpose. You know, that's what we teach. That's why I extol. Very important is to, to replace pride with purpose, man. What is your purpose? What is your purpose in interacting with this person today? What is your purpose of this building, at this house? Mm-hmm. What is your purpose? This should be what you focus on, not your pride and not how this person, uh, uh, not the perspective you feel right now dealing with this person. Uh, what matters is only what's the what desired outcome do you do you do you actually have at this time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really great point. You said um, you know how you have to treat everybody as if they were your own family, and uh, I really I really feel that. And and for me, that's kind of uh, you know how I look at even you know people from other cultures, other countries, other religions. You know, there yep. I, I think most people have a common commonality, common thread to them, and that you know we're all really trying to just get along and i mean or or make make enough money support our family but you know give our kids a good education you know you know bring food to the table you know basic stuff like that and and i think when you when you look at it that way you know i think it brings the humanity back to what you do <clears throat> which yes 
and, and so I, you know that's why I, I really love you and you guys you know talking about that you guys are, since you guys are a private business you know you have accountability or you have responsibility for everything that you do and so much you know so much more than 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 law enforcement would um because you know your <laughs> your your salary and how much you get paid and how many clients you have in the future d- definitely impacts how you treat people <laughs> directly yeah well what 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 happens is um people don't understand that we're accountable right we're civilly civilly and criminally accountable okay and so <clears throat> the money man is nothing Money, money is nothing. What I mean by that is this: when you have an excellent product, when you yeah. do something that's excellent, money automatically comes from that. Right. So you don't have to focus on money. I never think about money and clients and money and and when it comes to the mission, mm. because when you find out that there's people that can protect your property, your family, that can keep you alive and safe, mm-hmm. you want to hire them. You don't care where they are. Sure. You don't care about the cost when you have the money. Right. When you don't have the money. You just need it anyway. And how good is an organization that says, you know what? I will protect you, but sorry, you don't have the money. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Good luck. Hey, good luck to you. Right. I really hope you guys make it because, you know, then you could go to college. You get some money. You could afford us. Then we give you a life. Of course, right now, it looks like the guy right behind you is going to kill you. But, um, you know, let your relatives know when they get the insurance money from your death that they can hire us. (laughs) Funeral. Your funeral. I mean, so uh, it's just not stupid. Right, right. So, you know, I, I love what I do, man. I love um, how we help people. You know, what, what I, the way I explain what our actual purpose is, and I just got just saw something on Facebook today. There's a, a girl. She's actually on our website. Um, she was two years old. She was a baby. Her name is Imani, and they live in Arizona, her and her mother. But the, the, the girl was abducted and taken to Detroit, mm. and... Um, by the father who wanted to sell her to Yemeni men uh, for the passport, American passport. Wow. And um, he already had a deal lined up for $100,000. Wow. And, uh, yeah, we ruined that. <laughs> so we went to the house in Detroit, yeah, got access so the woman could get to her baby. We mm-hmm. never touched the child. We never touched the man. We just said we need to do a welfare check. He let us in the house. Her ID shows she lives there. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, we were her guests. He can't stop us from being there. Right. Uh, he, ha- he has no idea because being a drug dealer from Yemen, uh, he thought he'd be slick beating the American system by having ID that shows he lives somewhere else. Uh-huh. Hmm. That was not always a good plan, especially when the girl that he um, uses as cover woman has ID that says she lives there. He thought that'd be good too. put the house in her name. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that gave us legal right to be there. The FBI called me because he went to them and said, some paramilitary men came and stole my baby. So hmm. the FBI called me and they said, uh, who are you guys? We had you guys on, sur- we had the, the house under surveillance. Mm-hmm. We saw you guys go in the house mm-hmm. and the back of my Hummer has our phone number on it. So I guess the FBI just called the phone number. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of easy to figure out who we are. Right. Phone, numbers on, phone numbers on the boat. <laughs> you know? I saw us get followed one time by, I don't know, it was Homeland Security or something in the boat. Hmm. Uh, what, oh, it was a helicopter, Homeland Security helicopter. I said, okay, <laughs> if we're doing something illegal, it's kind of hard to do it with your website and your phone number on the side of the boat. <laughs> because, you're, you're being real sneaky. Uh, you're being real sneaky, right? <laughs> everyone can see us. We're the only boat that's black on top. Uh, black interior, black exterior, right. black hull. Um, and the reason why you don't have a black boat anywhere else, but uh, there's a reason. You know why? You know why you don't have black boats? No. Do you know why you don't do that? I don't know. Um, because you could die when the sun hits it. What do you mean? It's so hot that if you touch the boat, you'll oh. burn your skin. Oh really? Oh oh. <laughs> oh God! It's it's a million degrees. Wow. It's like you could cook something on there. Yeah. Wow. It looks cool, but you wouldn't want. You don't want to actually be on there. In the bright sunlight and touch the side. Ah, I don't touch the side. I, I stay see. on the inside. I see. But yeah, on the outside it's it's extremely hot. Wow. Uh, but it looks so cool in the. Uh, <laughs> if you look at our website. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine it does boat. look cool. <laughs> it's the coolest black boat ever. So <laughs> Homeland Security, state police, uh, um, uh, the, the sheriffs, uh, uh, all these different uh, Coast Guard. They've all pulled up and got brochures before. Oh wow! Great. <laughs> like this is the coolest boat ever. 
<laughs> and my uh, boat's not even that fast, man. It's a cabin cruiser. It does not go fast. Uh -huh. It just looks cool. It's just a good looking thing. <laughs> we rescue people on the boat, though. Oh, they are crazy. We rescue people, yeah. Yeah, we actually, like, if you fall off the boat or if your boat breaks down, we'll go tow you for free. Oh, nice. Tow you in. Yeah, just help you out. I've only had to be towed uh, three times. Wow. Uh, yeah. Vice, <laughs> uh, the, the, the HBO special Vice. Mm -hmm. You familiar with that? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, Vice came out, and they got on the boat with us last month and uh, cruised up and down Detroit, launched nice. their drone from our boat, wow. and then my boat then my boat broke down. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. So they got, they got to see a, a side of Detroit, literally the side of the river. Uh -huh. um, nice. We had to tie off and get towed out. Oh, man. <laughs> but I got a bunch of new stuff on the boat now. I had in the shop. Uh -huh. Got a bunch of modifications done, so uh -huh. it's all good. So I get it out of the shop tomorrow. Nice. Um, but um, <clears throat> ultimately, man, at the end of the day, protection protection is the highest form of love. If you actually love a community, you love people, you will protect it. And if you don't love people, if you don't love a community, you can't protect it. Right. It's impossible. We never protect what we do not love. Right. And we always protect what we do love. Right. So you, what makes a good staff person, what makes a good... Uh, a good protector is someone who genuinely loves people, man. Mm, mm. And, and and that's what I found out that I have a connection with staff members that are good people. They really like to see people do well. Like I, I like to see people happy, man. At the end mm. of the day, you know, if you're drunk or you're high and you're walking on the street, when I pull up to you, it's to, it's to help you not walk in the middle of the street and get hit by a car. Right. <laughs> so like, Oh God, am I in trouble? No, <laughs> you're not in trouble. Just walk on the sidewalk. Cause the cars come through here. You hit my car. Right. Like, okay, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Try not to, you know, walk in the wrong house or something because someone could shoot you. Um, you know, uh, I catch a drunk driver. He crashes into something. I don't know what it was. So uh, we, I have to call police. I'm on duty, right? So I'm mm. being paid to so call police. And then I take the keys. I ask him for the keys. He gives me the keys. I hide his keys in the back seat and in, in his, uh, tuck them in his seat. And he's like, Where, uh, where's my keys? And his car still works. Uh-oh. Uh, so he wants to keep driving, you say? <laughs> he wants to drive. He's like, uh -oh. I should just go. <laughs> sure. I was like, oh, yeah, no, man. <laughs> so the whole front of his car is cramped. Wow. The whole front of his car is caved in. Wow. But somehow the car is still running uh -oh. at first. I was like, yeah, I can't hear you. can turn the car off. I was like, oh, sir, can I have your keys? And I said, hey, what's your mom's? Who can I call, man? I need to call someone in your family so I can have right. them come you know, help you. Right. So he gives me his stepmother's number. <laughs> I call her and say, you know, he needs help over here. The police get there. The police are like, you took the keys out of the ignition. I said, actually, he took the keys out of the ignition, not me. Mm. So she says, well, we can't arrest him for DUI now. I said, <laughs> That's the first thing on their mind. <laughs> yeah, she said, you just ruined our case. I said, man, 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 man. Said, I'm not here to ruin your case and make your case. I can't, in good conscience, let this guy oh, keep control of his keys in this car with the car still running <laughs> right when i know he can't see straight right okay you actually drove in front of the car to get here imagine if i let said well, uh you know i can't really do anything about the keys of the car he starts the car drives down there and kills you guys right literally the car the way they came across his path to get where we are right so theoretically he could have just driven straight straight ahead floored it and hit them now the two cops will be dead right so then i guess i guess that would be a case then <laughs> but in my book <laughs> That would be a case of failure. Right. Failure to so, manage threat. Exactly. Failure to have public safety. Exactly. So prosecution is proof that you did not prevent predation, which means you had prosecutorial events, which means you had crime. Right. Which means you did not have public safety. <sighs> public safety is the absence of prosecution. Prosecution is the proof that you had an absence mm -hmm. of public safety. <laughs> it's nice you know you know i love i love it when you say <clears throat> how peace and or or yeah peace or uh, prosperity is actually helps you like like, like you, you know you say you don't do it for the money you help businesses but in helping businesses they get more prosperous and then they pay you more <laughs> so it's in like a it's a nice feedback loop <laughs> exactly and i built it that way so what i did was i made sure that the rich people get richer right and then i convert that into the money i need for my philanthropic uh, programs, helping people for free that can't afford services. Wow. So the point was to help people. I can't do that without money. 
Right. I don't have government money. I right. didn't get any stimulus money. Right. I don't have any bank loans. Everything came from sweat equity. Wow. It's nice. all general. I owe no money. I don't owe anyone. <sighs> I have no partners. Yeah. <laughs> I, I When I get paid, there's, I don't have to go dole it out to people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. no, I don't owe a bank. And that's mm-hmm. what people are saying. Like, you got to be in a situation where you're not in a debtor situation. That's where in traditional business, you, you get bank loans so high that you're stressed out just trying to function. Right. And I don't, I can focus because I don't have those issues. So, and uh, we also pre, we, we, uh, we pre built. Mm. We're a prepaid service. Okay. Oh, there's no billing. You pay for what you want. Right. It's called performance payments. You pay for the performance. Right, right, right. So often, you know, security guard companies traditionally, you pay them 90 days net, right? Mm-hmm. You pay them 90 days after they did the work. That's insane. You, you pay me nine minutes before we work or mm-hmm. 90 days before we work. Wow. <laughs> They're like, so we're going to pay you up front? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I've never heard of that. We have now. <laughs> <laughs> and let me be clear. You do not call us for a good deal. You can get a good deal. The police are cheaper than us. Right. If you want a good deal, you contact security guard, traditional car companies, or you can hire the cops. You can get a police officer and a car for $45 an hour here. We are $60 an hour mm-hmm. for the man. Then for the car and the man, it's $100 an hour. Wow. Right. It's not cheap. Right. $10 for 10 minutes of service. So, so, so then $10 you... $10 a month. So... So if you only need us for 10 minutes, instead of you having us there for an hour, right. you can pay 10 bucks and have us there for 10 minutes. That's checking your alarm. That's make sure your employees get in, your house, in their house. Right. Make sure your kids get out of their house in the morning or in their home. We check anything you need us to verify and protect hmm. to make sure that you're safely where you need to go. Um, and most of that just takes 10 minutes or less. So, so you said that you also have uh, free services for those that can't, can't afford it, like what they, when they call your number or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, I just left this meeting. Prosecutor, this judge, uh, he was in the prosecutor's office before he was a judge. He said that um, that they really loved our organization because we made it so victims could come to court. Because a lot of times victims are either too scared or have no transportation and scared. Mm. We make it so that they don't feel fear. Mm. They can actually prosecute the people that beat them, that robbed them, that raped them, that killed them. Mm. Um, I'm sorry, not the ones that killed them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the, in that case, but, the, the family. Yeah, 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 no, that's, that's true. And we yeah. have, we have, so a lot of people don't understand. It's like, why would a family need help if their family was already killed? Well, in real life, when people find out that you want them to go to jail, they get mad and want to kill you too. Right. Even though they just killed your family member, your family mm-hmm. member. So, um, and I know it's unfair to want to kill your whole family, but yeah, there's unfair people out here. Mm-hmm. They're called violent criminals. Right. And they're very unfair. Right. So, you know, so it's totally illogical, right? So a lady needs protection because people are driving by the house, coming to the house, threatening them. Mm-hmm. They killed her son. Mm-hmm. They want her to go to court and uh, and say that she's not mad or something. Mm-hmm. She has nothing to do with this. All she's doing is going to court just to talk, to see who killed her son. Right. That's it. She has nothing to do with this case. They're still coming to the house. Strange men in her backyard. Police come and check on her like after everything, after they've been terrorized. Mm -hmm. What we do is we stay with them and we physically stay at people's houses if necessary. Wow. With our rifles, we stay in their house and the men do not kill them. Hmm. The gangs do not kill them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've never lost a victim in 20 years. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're, you're, um, uh, yeah, your history is, I think, what'd you say? No lawsuit and and no. And no victims, right? And no, no lawsuits, no no court dates. No court none date. of us got prosecuted. Wow. And none of us, none of us are dead. Yeah. Six of us have been shot. Six of us have been shot. One female, five men. Uh-huh. No one's ever been prosecuted for shooting us. Not one person has ever been caught, arrested, talked to. And every single one of them, every single one of our shootings with, were with uh, massive numbers of uh, witnesses everywhere. Oh, okay. We were shot. We've been shot six Six of us have been shot. One female, five yeah, men. Right. Have been shot from 1995, 96 right. to 2001. Right. Okay. And every time we got shot, I learned a little more about how not to get shot again. Right. So we changed our tactics and then some other things changed and they stopped shooting at us. Uh, Let's just say that they feel it's the best to stop shooting at us. Yeah. 
and they did. Uh, but uh, uh, not to say they couldn't do it again today because we're out every night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, in Detroit, the city of Detroit, not a city, suburb of Detroit, the city, the mm-hmm. inner city. Right. And all, yeah, all the way around our communities are lots of crimes. Mm-hmm. We just we just make the criminals feel like this is not a good place to hunt. Yeah. Uh, the way we do that is by making sure they know, they believe we're formidable. They believe that we're not old people that will um, call the police and, and do nothing. They believe we'll, we'll, we'll stop them. And they believe that because they have history knowing of our organization. Yeah, yeah. So you must, you guys must have some reputation with, with the criminals and the gangs. And our, Yeah, our, our reputation is uh, being violent barbarians. That's our reputation. Really? Oh, from according to them? <laughs> yep. Yes. A police officer once told a, a guy that owns a $250 million company, the police officer said, um, you saw me leaving this guy's office. It's a, a, it's a $250 million company in 1998. Hmm. And I was being interviewed for this, this position where they were hijacking cigarette trucks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was, <laughs> so I, as I was leaving, this police officer walks in. He goes, hey, Viper. I was like, hey, how's it going? I, I knew this cop. Uh, he owns an off-duty security guard company, right? Mm. But I, I didn't know him personally. And and so he, I just knew of him. He's a bodybuilder mm-hmm. and a uh, much bigger guy than me. And so he walks in, the the, uh, the, the client's like, uh, how are you doing? He, goes, fine. he said, fine. He goes, you know, just left your office, right? The cop says that to the to the rich client. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And the rich client goes, oh, no, it says some guy was referred to me, talks like Brian Gumbel. I'm not, <laughs> I don't I'm not impressed. <laughs> so the, the cop was like, He's a violent barbarian. He has an organization of violent barbarians. You do not hire them unless you want people hurt, injured, destroyed. Wow. They're they're just they're horrible. They're wow. they're terrible. Yeah. So the, the client was like, that guy that talks like Brian Gumble <laughs> that just left here <laughs> is in charge of vi- violent barbarians. <laughs> He's like, Yes, sir. Yeah, you do not want to I have all cops. Um they're all armed. They're all off-duty cops. They're all veteran cops. Uh, quite a few of them are bodybuilders, and uh, they're all part of my tat, my team. You want to hire us? He was like, "Wait a minute. <laughs> You're saying that off-duty cops are going to be better than on-duty cops? On-duty cops have not helped me in the past three years, where I'm losing a hundred thousand a month in product. Mm. My men are being hijacked. They're being stabbed. Mm. They're being abducted. On-duty cops can't stop this, but your off-duty cop uh, uh, organization can stop it." What? There's no way I'm going to believe that. <laughs> you can't do it on duty. There's no way you can do it off duty. Right. He goes, he goes, but you know what you just did? I'm going to tell you, honestly, you just got that guy that left my office the job. Because <laughs> I need some violent barbarians. <laughs> he said, I'm hiring them right now, and you're the one who made it possible. Wow. That guy, I, I need to find that cop and give him a reward. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is now my longest standing client. Oh, really? Wow. We're almost at 20 years with that client. Wow. My, my men ride the tr- cigarette trucks throughout Detroit since 1998. Wow. Every day. <clears throat> so we have delivered successfully more cancer sticks than any other organization <laughs> in the history of mankind. <laughs> I'm so not happy about that. You know, I'm happy about the part where no one got abducted. Right. Comp was carried out. Uh, taxes were paid to the city of Detroit. And, uh, you know, uh, people are, 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 are living a safer life because of our actions. So at the end of the day, we made it so that commerce could happen right. by not having violence right. contributed to the city of Detroit. Right. And we have not had, in our 20 years, while escorting a billion dollars in wow. cigarettes to wow. their destinations, um, <laughs> we have not... <laughs> right, I'm very mad. <laughs> so, but, but we... I'm not mad enough to quit, but I'm very mad. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a Democrat Republican Democrat Republican person. So, <laughs> and really, I don't believe a two party system. To be honest, I think it's silly. Right. But and I and I do believe we should get a purple finger, one man, one vote, like the Iraqi people. Uh-huh. How can we free them, but we can't free ourselves? <laughs> Where's our purple finger? <laughs> purple finger. I, I have not heard about the purple finger. What is the purple finger? In Iraq, you, you they dip your finger in ink. When you, oh, when, when you vote? <laughs> ah, yeah, that's not how you voted. I, I see, I see. Oh, it's like proof that you vote. I see, I see. Yes, I want the purple finger for Americans. <laughs> so, 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 
but we can't get that because our vote doesn't count. Right. So, so the way I look at that, I mean, even if you don't agree with, you know, the the type of business that your, you know, that your client runs, still, you know, w- with that with that income, you can you can do the kind of philanthropic activities that you do. Yes. And so it's still you're you're still a benefit to the people who live around you. You know. That's exactly right. And and so what I did, and that's what I try to get across to, um, you know, kids that we mentor in our kids programs. Uh, you know, you find a way. Mm-hmm. You find a positive way to fund yourself. Mm-hmm. You do not need the government to fund you. Right. It's not necessary. There is no, you don't need anything you don't have. And I didn't have anything. Hmm. Uh, all I had was the outcome. That's all I had. And so the outcome can be leveraged. You just have to be able to convert it. You have to be intelligent. Right. You got to be able to figure things out. And if you can't figure things out, if you're not intelligent, life is going to be hard. So right. you need to work on uh, getting yourself smarter. Right. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> you know, my objective is to get people to see that violence is, is, is a choice. Right. Um, England is, and Britain is filled with a lot of different types of people that are not getting along. Somehow the killings are way less than ours. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. England's also very small, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that is a good point. Uh, it is like a small, it's like a state damn near. So, <laughs> um, we're kind of comparing apples and oranges there, but it <laughs> seems the same. Um, but uh, the, the important thing is to realize that our our concept of killing and necessity is, is based on traditional violence in Americana culture. Mm-hmm. It is not real. Mm-hmm. There is no moral imperative to kill. Mm-hmm. You are not required to kill anyone. Mm-hmm. If I killed based on law, I would have killed... 30 police officers by now and over a hundred citizens. Okay. Hmm. It's not true. So when I saw people do things that looked funny or furtive gestures, I did not draw down. I did not shoot them. Right. And in quite a few situations, it happened to be police officers that didn't identify themselves or didn't realize something or, you know, broke a a rule. Like uh, some officers broke into a building that I was living in uh, because a security guard thought that I broke in. So they broke in to look for a break in (laughs) as as an undercover agent. No, it was 10 officers coming through my window and they kicked the window in. Hmm. So I was going to mouse hole my wall with my AR. Oh, my God. With my my steel core ammunition. Uh Oh, (laughs) when suddenly I hear a clear voice say Detroit police. Right. I immediately put the rifle down, identified myself. Right. And the reason why that was never supposed to happen is there's a rule that when a police officer is, um, as a rule, no matter what law enforcement officer you uh, department you work for, mm. if there is reason to believe there's a break in, you must see the break in. You can't go breaking in a building saying, I have reason to believe there's a break in. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they broke in my window, literally. The window is locked with a latch. Oh, my God. Right? Yeah. And they kicked it in. I hear the metal hit the... So I'm not thinking these are cops. Clearly, police don't break into a place. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, this is my, my school that I had before. And I lived above the school at that time. Mm-hmm. This is about 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so I, I knew they weren't cops because cops would never do that. Right. <laughs> so that's why I got my rifle. Like, oh, my God, it's 10 men coming to take me out. Right. Gosh. <laughs> and I can hear the boots... Coming through my window, wow. I was like, "Oh my god, it's it's a gang!" Oh my, oh my god. god! And it turns out it was police officers. Wow! And I thought to myself, "Is there not a rule against kicking in windows <laughs> and going in someone's house to see if someone broke in?" Isn't that wouldn't that be weird? Like, <laughs> like I don't understand. So I, you know, I train police officers, and now I've been through a lot of training with them over yeah. the years. And uh, yeah, it clearly you're not supposed to break in to see if there's a break in. <laughs> a little bit of a contradiction there, <laughs> right? Kind of, yeah, it's got it. And illegal, right? And illegal. But also, it's not smart. Right, right. If you're not... breaking in, it's not broken in already. Right. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? Um, oh, you, why'd you break in the bank? Uh, we thought there was a bank robbery, so we came in to break in the bank. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. <laughs> And then, and then, what if you did open fire, and, and and you could have said, "Well, I didn't know there were officers. They broke in, right?" Yeah, and then I'd be opening. I'd have to open my new office in uh, uh, New Mexico. No, no Mexico, Mexico, <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> actual right. Mexico. Right. So, 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 go ahead, go ahead. 
hood. So it's my, it's because I view the positives that I don't take action uh, and create fatal force outcomes. Right. One guy was reaching in his pocket really fast and he was yelling something incoherent and uh, he was saying something aggressive. I don't know. I just, I, I, I looked at him as mentally ill mm. and he, he started reaching his pocket real fast, huffing and puffing. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, what is this guy doing? Right, right? Yeah. now? If I was using fear-based training, this guy would get ran by my vehicle and or shot. Mm. He's clearly reaching for something right. aggressively and looking at me. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, he pulls out a badge and goes, I'm retired police. <laughs> oh, <shoot. laughs> now, right before this, he said to me, he goes, um, your, truck sit, your truck says... Uh, Electrical, your trade police. I was like, no, it's collect guys, my system. And he, and he said, was you the police? I said, no, I was not the police. He goes, are you a police? No, I am not a police officer. Well, how can you teach the police is to be the police? I said, sir, I I don't uh, I don't teach policing. There's nothing on my truck that says I teach policing. Uh. It says I teach. I have tactical training for us as law enforcement tactical training. Mm. Tactical training is not policing. Right. I don't know anything about, uh, um, you know, uh, pulling people over and fighting off the pills that they have are schedule C or three or whatever, mm. or mm. searching them for this or that. All I deal with weapons and violence and reading people's body language. And that's why I'm not about to attack you. Right. I see there's something wrong with you. And he starts <laughs> reaching, right? And it turns out he was a police officer. Right. I mean, imagine if I was if I was trained as a cop, right. this guy's acting aggressively and then reaches his pocket. That's called a furtive gesture. Right. And he was armed, too, by the way. Ooh. Wow. So imagine if I used fear to, to dictate my action, I would have shot that guy. Sure. Definitely. And then he peels his, peels away, you know. And you know what he was doing at the time? Looking at we were I was getting my boat out of the water. And so he was doing something in a marina. This is not anything official. We're just two people in a two, two separate trucks. And he starts making small talk with me, mm. gets angry, and draws down his badge on me in a violent, aggressive fashion. Hmm. Uh -huh. Like, yeah. So that's why you got to be very careful about responding to stimulus, right? Right, right? What looks like violence is often just a furtive gesture of nothingness. Right. There is no actual violent intent, there's just a, a movement. It's not aggressive mm. in, in, with intent to harm you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I, I mean, a uh, 100 citizens, I had two kids rush me at a, at a party. It was a house party. It looked like Project X. Thousands of kids showed up. And and it was an a impromptu party in an upscale neighborhood. Mm -hmm. A professional athlete's daughter graduated from college. And uh, he wasn't even there. So I'm telling these kids to leave. You're talking about a thousand kids and just me <laughs> because all my men are somewhere else. And this is not supposed to be a party. We're not supposed to be working there. Mm -hmm. um, this we're working the, the community and I'm by myself at this particular time, but there's, there's nothing going on uh, that requires multiple men. And all of a sudden we get a call. There's some kind of giant house party. Mm -hmm. and I go down there and it, it's, it's just a massive number of kids. I get the kids to leave without incident. I had to cuss them out. Nothing's all right, kids have a good night. I have a sound device that yeah. makes noise and yeah. some spot, and I have a um, I have a, a strobe light. Uh, They're like, oh god, and then, you know, <laughs> oh, it's noisy. Oh god! So one of the kids <laughs> like, you better get the thing on my face, <laughs> I said, sir. As a young man, let's go into the party. Let's go. Yeah. He's like, I say, don't put that light on my face. <laughs> so he put his fist back and ran at me. Right. Oh wow. And, and he's like. <laughs> so he ran up like two feet from me, like he was gonna hit me. Right. And I said, "All right, young man, have a good night." <laughs> he was like, "Okay." <laughs> now, mind you, it's dark. Right. Wow. I could barely see him as he's running up to me. Right. But I could hear him. I could hear his feet running up to me uh -huh. in total darkness. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I was prone to fear, clearly that kid would get pepper sprayed hit with a baton, tasered, or shot right. for all of that. Right, right. Right? Different, I'm not scared. It's a different, <laughs> so, different, different mindset. <laughs> right, so I just grab his elbow. Come on, young man, have a good night. He's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I turn around to the other kids like, oh, oh, you shine light on me? You don't mess with me. And he takes his shirt off. 
<laughs> I swear it's like five seconds later. So now this kid's like, you shine a light on me again, we're going to have problems. I was like, young man, I shine a light right on him. So young man, get in the car. Get in the car right now. He was like, I told you, don't put the light on me. <laughs> and he came to run up on me, right? I grabbed him by his elbow, turned him around. I said, get in this car. Have a good night. He was like, man, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I was like, hey, hey, get in the car. Let's go. Have a good night. He, his, his boys were there. I was like, get your boy. Come on, let's go. All right, guys, let's go. Let's go. Have what? a good night. It's over. Right. It's over, man. I, I Could I have legally beat the shot of them and attacked them and sprayed them? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, would, would it have been legally justifiable and legally necessary according to, you know, the, 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 the fearologists? Right, right. The, the killologists? Uh -huh. The fearologists would have a, a field day. Right. Right? Definitely. All I had was some sweaty kids getting in the car. I mean, these kids are rushing me, man. Oh, my God, they're rushing me. Right, 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 right. Yeah. It's not that serious, I, man. I, I felt it's threatened. The mentality. Right. Yeah, wow, awesome. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't want to keep you too long, um, but uh, please, if, if people want to reach you and find out more and contact you, uh, what's the best way they can do so? Well, I encourage them to look at threatmanagementcenter.com and also Google us. In general, you'll see lots of stories, all good stories. There are no bad stories, um, and uh, all positive, man, all positive. We train law enforcement for free every Monday at 7 o'clock at our facility here in Detroit. Wow. Uh, we train, I train law enforcement instructors to be the instructors for other officers in their departments. Hmm. Um, and what we specifically teach law enforcement officers how to do is how to dominate threats without injuring people, mm -hmm. without hurting them, without shooting them, to not be gun dependent. We show them how to use psychology and biomechanics and uh, something I created called protective proxemics in order to create a non-adversarial interaction. Uh, the same thing we use as bodyguards. Uh, and then we teach a free class for families called Free Family Friday hmm. every Friday at 7 p.m. at our facility. Hmm. So we teach both police and civilians. We give them one free class, one hour a week. They can come as much as they want. Wow. Get some basics, hmm. right? These things will help you. Wow. Uh, and then they also we have, we have paid courses throughout the week, paid clients, um, and... Uh, we have um, uh, we do corporate seminars throughout the week, and uh, tomorrow I got one with Department of Human Ser Services. Uh, these are the executives, the people that are managers that deal with uh, um, children situations. Hmm. You know, abused um, children situations. Oh, okay. Here. And so, what we teach them is how to same thing: how to use psychology, not forceology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how to inspire change, not to intimidate people into change. Right. Uh, and so how to create a nonviolent outcome by design uh, and replace hope with actual skill set. All right. Beautiful. Remember, this, this is Detroit, man. So we've actually tested it. It's not theory. We're not in Detroit, Iowa. We're in Detroit, Michigan, a.k.a. dystopia. Right. We create nonviolence right here, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's not like we work uh, like guardian angels one hour a week or two hours a week or some, you know, these, these organizations that, our fly by night, we're long term. And so it's been going on and evolving for 20 years. Hmm. And uh, we have we have many families. Uh, and this is what we're most proud of, man. If you think about like, what's the purpose of this, mm -hmm. we go into people's lives and we erase a rape, a robbery, a killing from happening to a family. We erase it from their family tree. Hmm. We make sure it doesn't happen. We erase it, man. Imagine how great that is to know that you stop that from occurring mm -hmm. in someone's family. Yeah. You know what I mean? A rape, robbery, or killing mm -hmm. never took place because your direct intervention, your direct threat management, it's very positive, man. It's very, it's very powerful. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's great to see these families come back years later, uh, and, and to, uh, you know, to have that positive uh, effect on them and see how happy they are years later. Wow. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And, and uh, yeah, I just love how, you know, so many people, especially in the livery movement, you know, talk about the police and how so much corruption and they have, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, their their <clears throat> how do you say um, the feedback, the incentive they have is for more arrests, for more, you know, more extortion, right. more tickets, more all this kind of stuff. And you guys have a completely different feedback mechanism. And um, and, and you not only it's With not only title. Say again? Which starts with our title, which starts with our title, which is not policing. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that and and and, yeah. and uh and you guys not only it's not only theory, but you guys are putting into practice in like the, the worst possible area <laughs> in the country. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if it works here, it works everywhere. Right. Uh and then we use we use non lethal weapons. Uh we use devices that are specifically designed not to kill people. Uh we have things like pepper pistols. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, but we don't use, we don't use them, man. If you know how to talk to people, you know how to psychologically communicate with people in a positive way, right? And to create conditions, even with the predators, that there's no way for them to win. Mm-hmm. And once they believe in you, you don't have problems. When they see us and they see our uniforms, they see how serious we are. They just realize it's better to just go away, right? And we let them go away. We're not here to capture them, right? If you stole TV, we don't want you to steal a TV, but you know what? We're not going to do anything about it. We're just going to film you, send you on your way, tell mm-hmm. the police which way you went. We're not going to kill anybody or or get injured or kill people or get injured or injure people over toasters, TVs, and tools. <laughs> right. We have insurance for that. Right. If you want to keep them out of your house, I can show you how to do that. Right. Uh, I charge money for that. Right. But I will show you how to take your vulnerability assessment and make a threat management assessment, create a safe structure, which make it incredibly hard for someone to get in, mm. even with a sledgehammer. Right. But it costs money. Right. Everything costs money. Sure. And if I capture that guy, it's going to cost you 10000 on a small end to prosecute him for me sitting around a courthouse. Mm-hmm. So this concept of kill and capture, it's only government agents are going to be able to do that for you. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? So once it's, once it's corporate, you're going to be like, oh, shoot, someone's stealing my TV. Bye-bye. Because <laughs> once you dollarize this, only a government worker makes it feasible to go to court and 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 prosecute people, mm-hmm. I am way too expensive. There is almost nothing <laughs> short of your life, <laughs> nothing short of your life or your orifices is worth all the money it's going to cost you. Right. Okay. Like someone punched you. <laughs> your orifices. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got that. That's a, good, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> so if someone punches you, right? And you and I come over saying, "I you want me to take them down for you." You're going to be like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mean like take him to custody and detain him? Uh, yeah, I can detain him. Sorry, he's a threat to you. I can detain him or ward him off. It's your choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to be like, oh, let me dollarize this. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> How much is it going to cost me? <laughs> right, right, right. So basically, I, I give you a car. Right. <laughs> yes, sir. You, you're, by the time it's over, you will have bought me a, a nice little car. <laughs> Can you just tell him not to punch me anymore? I right. Sure can. <laughs> Bye-bye. $10. That's $10. Bye-bye. <laughs> Get off the property, sir. Okay. <laughs> now, we take him down, we take him to custody, right. we prosecute him. You're going to be very mad. Right. That bill. Especially when you find out how much dicking around they do in court. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. We could have 10 court dates. Right. Exactly. And then you're like, how'd you get that? Why'd you guys get a helicopter? <laughs> you, helped us. You, helped us. you helped us. You helped us get our new helicopter. Yeah, your Thank second, you, your, your second boat. What happened? <laughs> your second boat. I should thank you, sir. This one looks even cooler than the first one. <laughs> right. I'm going to name this after you, sir. <laughs> right. You made it possible. So this whole anti-violence movement thing that I represent also represents prosperity movement right because without violence you can make a lot more money right definitely so i offer people uh peace and from peace we're able to leverage and create the only the only outcome there is and that's positivity and from that there is prosperity so focus on creating a peaceful positive environment and automatically it's going to be more prosperous Kids can sleep at night. Adults can rest mm. uh, and own property mm-hmm. without fearing for their safety. Mm-hmm. And the lack of predation means property values goes up. Mm-hmm. Everyone lives better. Everyone survives better. Everyone has a better quality of life and economics increases for everyone. Even the city gets more residents, gets more businesses, mm-hmm. and gets more tax revenue. So everyone is a winner, literally, when we do not have violence and crime predation right wow so beautiful magnificent i love it i love supporting you i love uh I'm trying to help you get the message out there i know you've done Thank a lot of you. interviews and, uh, and i hope my audience will check out your site check out what you guys are Please about do. and support yeah, you really. any way they can because i think you guys are representing the the future of protection and true defense <clears throat> and, uh, and that's our objective is to spread everywhere 
we got franchise facilities that we're uh, training centers that we're going to be um, uh, introducing in 2017. And uh, we're also looking at, you know, spreading to different cities, different states, and eventually different countries. I'm, I'm going to uh, hmm. Nigeria next month. Wow. Uh, with the concept of possibly getting a, a threat manager center started there wow. uh, with some uh, business people there. They're very interested. People are really interested in how they create an, uh, an environment where violent crime does not take place mm. and uh, prosperity is a result. Mm. They really like that part. But they, the one thing I got to get them to understand, and this is why, why I'm glad that you, you know, took this time out to interview me. Uh, it's really about creating an environment based on vision. Mm. Not based on focused on money. Right. So it's the mission over money. Right. And the money is a byproduct of the mission. Yeah. It is not the focal point. Right. And so I, I wouldn't have any money if I thought about the money. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I don't make any money off communities. I make money off of wealthy corporations. Mm -hmm. I funnel that money into my life and into um, the the uh, families that can't afford services and, and into the communities themselves. Because the communities are not, they're not a, a financially... Um, profitable situation but my wealthy major corporations that that do have a lot of money like the one company i told you about they were two hundred two hundred and fifty million dollar company yeah. they're now a 300 million dollar company <laughs> nice okay so these companies have the money i converted it they don't feel happy or comfortable without me mm. because i pre i represent your ability to sleep at night knowing you have an entire paramilitary positive force that keeps your products flowing without violence, crime, and court dates. No wow. collateral legal issues. Wow. Think about that. It's a win-win. <laughs> it's a win for everyone, man. It's real positive. Uh, police are positive. They're supporting us in our communities because at the end of the day, they're winners. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so we're getting a really, really positive uh, uh, legal connections as well with the law enforcement community that's interested in public safety. Because there are a lot of officers, good officers, that, that do care about public safety they're just part of a system that cares about prosecution, right. which is, you know, where there's always this, uh, uh, you know, neutral negative kind of uh, uh, inappropriate interaction between civilians and, and police. Mm. We need to get the police on the same pattern, on the same path uh, as the public, which is prevention of all those negative metrics mm. and reward police for positives, reward for police for the outcomes we're looking for. You know, if police had no... Uh, um, uh, 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 cars crash, they get a bonus. If police had no injured uh, people taken into custody, they get a bonus. Hmm. If police ended up with no killings in a department, they get a bonus. Mm -hmm. All you do is reward for all the positives, and you'll have them. Right. You change, change the incentives. Yeah. Yes, and then exchange incentives. Right. And then because of, that doesn't happen, the lawsuits go down 50%. Right. 90% of the lawsuits. Right. That's where you get the money from mm -hmm. to reward the officers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from the lack of, law, the lack of lawsuits. Right. You can literally drop down the lawsuits by 50%, and that other 50% is what you use for the actual uh, paying of the cops, <laughs> for the positive outcomes. Yeah. So, that's that's one of my. It, 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 you remind me of a quote by Albert Einstein, which is, um, "Don't worry about making money. You know, worry about providing value." Because, and I think that's, that's what it. that's what you guys are doing. You know, that's it. completely, that's it. and uh, you guys are very successful. So yeah, awesome. So please, everyone, check out. Go to his website. Go to the Facebook page. Check out what he's about, and uh, support him because I think we need more people like this, more organizations, and I hope that you do spread because I think this can have a really, really positive impact on uh, you know. Other countries that have major, major crime rates, you know, like what right. Colombia and you know, <laughs> you know, countries that are really, really in, in Colombia and Venezuela. All you do is hire the police, and all of a sudden, those bandidos that look like police will stop abducting people, right? Magically, right? So, yeah, awesome, Mag <clears throat> so beautiful. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, great, great talking with you, Dale. I really appreciate it. Um, so if Thanks any. For having me. No problem. So if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so uh, through Patreon, patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism. Uh, you can also do through, uh, through Bitcoin or PayPal. Uh, links are below. And also through clicking on my Amazon affiliate links, um, and you can make your purchases there. Uh, and I get a commission at no extra cost to you. And help me 
interview more fascinating people like Dale here that I love to do and I would love to do more. And as we were just talking about, we all respond to incentives, right? <laughs> so I love doing this. I offer these videos for free. But uh, of course, you know, um, your time is not really free because you, there's always opportunity costs to doing something else. So monetary compensation is always encouraged and appreciated. Uh, so thank you very much, Dale. Wonderful conversation. Uh, so this is... Great. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.